Alright everyone, welcome back to another social studies lecture. Okay, today we're going to wrap up our entire uh, syllabus content. Okay, with the very last chapter here, Unit 11 on the security impacts of globalization. Okay, so essentially this will be the last impact uh, of globalization they will learn in this syllabus. Alright, so we're going to focus on two main ideas. Okay, in this case, uh, cyber security and transnational terrorism. Okay, so let's get straight into it. Okay, as always, these are the learning objectives for today's uh, lecture. Okay, just take some time to look it over. Okay, let's go. Alright, so first things first, we're going to talk about cyber security and uh, how globalization has caused the cyber security threat. Uh, to become exponent exponentially larger okay so um as you have learned before globalization is the idea of interconnections right so uh we have also <clears throat> based of these interconnections concluded about uh the positive and negative impacts of technological advancements okay so now uh, the threats to our countries are often transnational, meaning they are not just from within our own borders. Okay, they can be originating from anywhere in the world. Hence, uh, we actually have this idea of a transna uh, transnational nature of today's threats as a result of globalization. Hence, we have this topic. Okay, so the first things first, we're going to talk about technological advancements and cybersecurity. Now, technological advancements have already resulted in the rapid growth of a lot of online networks. And today, we store a majority of our confidential data online. So, now that we have uh, these connectedness, okay, through the use of the internet and the World Wide Web, it is much, much easier also for people who are malicious with malicious intent, okay, to steal our data from anywhere in the world and anonymously all right so these stock confidential data will now become very vulnerable to cyber attacks okay that can be launched from anywhere in the world now cyber criminals are essentially people who you know utilize malicious software or as most commonly known malware okay to hack into different networks to illegally keyword illegally access the information for instance, uh, be it uh, for government secrets or business secrets, okay, all these things are, are often the the, the uh, victims or threats of uh, these type of cyber criminals or hackers, okay. So if they gain access to sensitive information, okay, that is very problematic for the organization as a whole. For instance, countries themselves are already using these uh, cybersecurity flaws, okay, to launch espionage attacks on other countries. Okay, the word espionage essentially refers to the act of spying. Okay, espionage is essentially spying. Okay, in layman terms, it's spying. Okay, so uh, in 2013, the US accused China uh, to uh, cyber attacking American government networks and stealing sensitive information on all these things. And in turn, they responded by saying that the US has been doing exactly the same thing for many, many years before that already. Okay, so as you can tell, all right, cybersecurity flaws are already ingrained into our systems and there will always be people who are going to try to exploit those things or those uh, vulnerabilities. Now, there are some people called hacktivists. Okay, hacktivists is actually a, a combination of two words, hacker plus activist. Okay, so these are activists that actually break into government networks to steal secret documents, okay, and release them to the public because they feel like these documents should be seen by the public. Okay, so uh, the most um, significant example of this, of such a hacktivist, is Julian Assange. I don't know if uh, any of you know him, but uh, essentially, Julian Assange launched this website called Wikileaks. Okay, Wikileaks is where he actually released a lot of American secret documents, okay, 
So he said that the public had the right to know what the government of America was doing. Okay, the government should not have the right, okay, to you know put this uh, information in a confidential network and not let anybody else know about it. So he essentially took that document and then posted it on the internet for everybody around the world to see. Now, the government argued, okay, that these leaks actually compromised national security and put a lot of soldiers' lives at risk and also may harm America's diplomatic relations with other countries. Okay, so you can see the, you know, there's uh, what he disputed to be the positive effects and the government responded with the negative effects here. So whether hacktivism is a right thing or not a right thing is really not for us to you know determine, it's for us to evaluate and think about it critically. Okay, so there's always positive and negative that comes out of these situations. Okay, so but this is one example okay of the uh you know certain people utilizing uh the vulnerabilities in our cybersecurity systems, okay, either for malicious intent or for good as well. Okay. Similarly, individuals and businesses are also targeted for you know certain uh, information, trade secrets, money, and all these kind of things, all right? So I think I don't need to go into much detail about that. It should be quite self-explanatory. So how do we manage these cyber security threats? Now, as we said before, right, cyber criminals operate under the cover of anonymity from anywhere in the world, which means it is very difficult actually for us to, you know, be to even uh, identify who they are or where they are. Okay, so many governments are taking uh, cyber crime as a very serious um, problem. And uh, this is the case in Singapore as well. Okay, especially after we have faced a lot of cyber attacks on ourselves. Okay, so for example, in 2013, Okay, the PM website and the president's website were also hacked. Uh, although the criminals were caught eventually, but it caused a lot of waste of time and damage, okay, and the credibility of the government itself all were put into question here, okay. And uh, more recently, you will notice uh, there's, uh, you know, uh, there was a Sing Health hack, okay, where a lot of people's private health information was released. And also, uh, you know, stuff like phishing scams from the for the banks and whatnot. Okay, these are all part of this entire idea of cybersecurity threats. Okay, so we need to take a lot more action in order to uh, manage these cybersecurity threats. Now there are eight examples. Okay, that you need to know. First example. Okay, we actually upgraded the, our cyber watch center. Okay, so they will be able. Our government is able to track. Uh, these malicious cyber actions, okay, and take the necessary measures uh, as quickly as possible. Secondly, we have also introduced the uh, National Cyber Security Master Plan in 2018. Okay, so essentially this is uh, to, you know, it's a master plan. Okay, master plan is essentially the plan for the government uh, to work on a certain idea or certain topic. Okay, so in this case, cybersecurity, they were going to increase the number of cybersecurity experts, educate people on the need for cybersecurity, and also enhance the nation's cybersecurity infrastructure. So this is their plan. Third, uh, they also launched a awareness and outreach program. Okay, so uh, I don't know, I think some students are also a part of this, I think it's called the Cyber Wellness SAP program okay so essentially the idea is that we want to create greater awareness of cyber security threats amongst people uh, crime watch okay I think all of you know what crime watch is this very famous Singaporean uh, public education program okay about crime in Singapore they also started to uh, raise awareness of such cyber security uh, threats by you know talking about them and reenacting these cyber crime cases fourth the uh, Cyber Security Agency okay, was established in 2015 to protect our nation's critical cyber infrastructure and uh, for example in the energy sector or banking sectors, areas of which are very important to Singapore's national security and also our economy. Okay, so it's managed by PCI, sorry, MCI and also reports to the Prime Minister. 
Okay, so essentially, uh, there's actually another uh, part to this. I think the SAF is also launching its own attachment, okay, or its own service branch for specifically uh, things related to um, you know, cyber security wise. Fifth, okay, in 2016, the government announced that civil servants will not be able to access the internet from the government issued computers okay so this is to prevent people uh, from gaining unauthorized access to the government system okay without even the employees knowledge okay so uh, as to prevent hackers from planting malware and gaining access to the government sec uh, government network sixth we are also working with other countries in the region to fight cybercrime Okay, for example, uh, this uh, AP Cert, uh, Asia Pacific Computer Emergency Response Team, right? This is for mainly the Asia Pacific countries. So we formed this uh, organization to fight cyber attacks together, okay, and to strengthen uh, the region, the Asia Pacific region's ability to combat and manage uh, cyber threats, okay? So for instance, we are sharing information, we're sharing expertise, right, to fight this cyber crime together. Seventh, uh, essentially this is an addition to the AP CERT thing. We also do the uh, ASEAN CERT incident drill. Okay, so this is for ASEAN member states specifically, okay, to enhance further cooperation with those who are in this uh, ASEAN CERT incident drill team, okay, or, or rather the ASEAN members of AP CERT. And Singapore actually founded uh, AP CERT as well as one of the members of the steering committee. All right, eighth. Okay, the eighth strategy is for the government plan to working with private companies. So IMD is actually finding out or whether it's uh, working with a lot of reputable companies, okay, to strengthen our cyber security in, in Singapore. And also they are being uh, brought in to basically train and educate personnel for government purposes, business purposes. Okay, so they will be a more people will be able to you know have a greater ability to fight cyber crimes as well. Now, uh, there's also a ninth thing which is uh something that's more recent, which is uh the addition of digital defense. Okay, uh, as uh one of the pillars of total defense. Okay, so this is another example of what we are doing currently. Okay, so uh, although the government and a lot of companies are starting to put a lot more measures in place to prevent cyber attacks, uh, us ourselves, okay, we have a lot to do as well. Okay, for example, uh, maintaining our firewall, antivirus uh, software, creating strong passwords, okay, be careful of uh, what we consume on the internet, and also to prevent uh, our browsers from storing information about ourselves, for example, by turning on incognito mode so that cookies are, are not being stored. Okay, so as you can tell, uh, Singapore takes a whole nation approach to uh, combating cyber crime and it is one of the increasing, most increasingly dangerous forms of crimes uh, in today's society. Okay, especially given the transnational nature of it. That's why we're talking about it. Uh, here in globalization okay so these are just some things to take note of it's not too difficult to understand i think it's quite uh i mean it's quite obvious okay given that uh, we have been going through uh, and you were born in a digital age anyways okay so uh shouldn't be too difficult now the main part i want to talk about for this lecture is actually on transnational terrorism okay so when terrorists operate beyond one country border and the impact is actually felt in more than one country. This is what we call transnational terrorism. Now, uh, in recent years, the number of people dying from terrorist attacks has increased significantly. Okay, so uh, also the economies of these countries affected by terrorist attacks have also uh, suffered greatly. Okay, as 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 a, as a result of these terrorist attacks. Now. Why is terrorism, or rather transnational terrorism, so devastating for a country? Okay, there's four main reasons. First, threats come from within and beyond. Okay, so there is a, always a possibility of domestic terrorism. 
and at the same time there's also an equally large threat of foreign terrorism okay that is double uh, issue here okay second terrorists they target civilians okay in the normal warfare usually they're targeting armed forces personnel but terrorists attack specifically civilians this is to create the atmosphere of fear okay in the country third it is impossible almost impossible to identify uh, a terrorist until they have already carried out the terrorist attack okay so it's even more difficult to you know uh, to stop these heinous acts from happening lastly they do not follow the conventional rules of warfare okay international humanitarian law actually has rules for war and obviously terrorists you know they won't follow this because you know it's anarchism okay so they don't follow uh, the standardized uh, international humanitarian law anyways so this all makes terrorism such a great threat to a lot of countries worldwide today so what are some impacts now uh, obviously globalization has already contributed to the rise of terrorist uh, threats and attacks okay so for example uh, not only does uh, the internet, okay, the internet itself already uh, poses a lot of problems because nowadays people can actually, uh, you know, utilize the internet, okay, to spread their beliefs and whatnot. So essentially use a propaganda, okay, so the development of technology. So they can spread their ideology, they can raise funds, transfer funds, collect intelligence, all sorts of things using uh, the you know technological advancements and also uh, there's a point about development in transport right today we are so connected we are so reliant on transportation that uh, number one terrorists can get to different places much faster and much quicker and if uh, they do decide to attack uh, the transport infrastructure it will be massive massive damage as well okay so a lot of countries have already experienced terrible, terrible attacks. For instance, the most infamous terrorist attack would probably be the 9-11 attacks, okay, which happened on 11th of September 2001. Okay, essentially, uh, terrorists from Al-Qaeda hijacked these American commercial aircraft and they crashed them into selected targets uh, around the New York, Washington area. So uh, the most uh, significant damage was uh, actually the World Trade Center in New York. Okay, so and also the Pentagon, which is the headquarters of the US Armed Forces. So this attack alone, okay, so these, uh, what, these attacks that happened on this day actually caused the death of more than three, or around 3,000 people of different nationalities. And it, it is one of the most... Uh, devastating terrorist attacks to ever have happened on US soil okay so this is uh, why post 9-11 there was a lot a lot a lot of changes that were made by not just the Americans but also a lot of countries around the world uh, so for example American government removed sensitive information from the internet so that you know enemies or terrorists don't have uh, easy access to such information and also, they also launched the, or rather formed the Transportation and uh, Transportation Safety Administration, the TSA, okay? And uh, I think if you've ever been to America or you have had friends or you've heard stories about the TSA, you will notice that they're not, they're not very um, kind, to say the least. They are very strict often and uh, a lot of people think they're overly strict. But uh, this whole idea that, you know, you cannot... Uh, bring uh, too much liquid on board an aircraft or you have to surrender certain things or you know why you are being subject to such um, you know s s like such uh, extravagant security checks okay when you're boarding or you're passing through immigration and whatnot okay it's all because of the 9-11 tax okay post uh, pre-9-11 uh, these things were much less lax or much laxer than, than, than today now, um, let's just give you a little bit of context for uh, Al-Qaeda, okay, which was the terrorist organization that was uh, actually uh, uh, the ones who 
committed these horrible acts on uh, September 11th. Okay, so history students, you should know, 1979, the USSR invaded uh, Afghanistan. Okay, so a Saudi Arabian man by the name of Osama bin Laden actually went to Afghanistan to help the Afghans fight the Soviet invaders. In fact, he was an American operative working with the CIA at the time to fight against the USSR. Okay, and uh, if you know anything about Osama bin Laden, is that he was the mastermind behind 9-11, which is a very cruel irony. Okay, a very cruel turn in it, twist in the, you know, the events of the world. Okay, so essentially Al Qaeda was formed in nineteen eighty nine, and they invited Muslims, okay, to be a part of this uh, Muhajadin idea, okay, to come to Afghanistan to fight the Soviet invaders. Now, uh, today Al Qaeda is uh, also is a much smaller organization today. Uh, mainly because of the larger influence of ISIS, okay, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, essentially, Al Qaeda wants to end American influence in the Middle East, and they want to establish a, a global Islamic caliphate, essentially, okay, lo a global Islamic government. Now they use, uh, these ideas of globalization, okay, to conduct a very violent acts. They use internet to plan and coordinate their attacks and to move funds to another country to fund their terrorist activities. Okay, and a lot of terrorist attacks in the early 2000s and in the 90s, okay, were all carried out by Al-Qaeda. Okay, so following 9-11, uh, the US, okay, under uh, Bush Jr., actually declared war on global terrorism and they actually invaded the uh, Taliban that then Taliban-led Afghanistan, okay, where Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda were based. Okay, at, at that time, uh, they fled Afghanistan, okay, following the uh, American invasion. Now, today, uh, Muslim leaders all across the world still condemn Al-Qaeda and its related uh, Islamic extremist terrorist groups, okay, for not following the true teachings of Islam. I think I've mentioned this previously, okay, when it comes to diversity chapter, Okay, where actually uh, the extremist ideas right that um, that these uh, terrorist organizations follow are not true teachings of Islam. Islam actually promotes peace. They don't want people to kill civilians and, and they're against uh, suicide essentially. Okay, so um, these, uh, these extremists are just grossly misinterpreting uh, the Islamic uh, what the Islamic text do say okay and and they're using this as a basis for them to commit these horrible acts okay so uh inadvertently it has also caused a whole bunch of problems re relating to islamophobia okay so people are wrongfully discriminating against those who practice the islamic faith simply because of their faith and even though they have nothing to do with extremist ideologies okay so that is a greater societal problem that, that these uh, terrorists have also brought about. Now, continuing on the war on terror, in, in on the 2nd of May 2011, actually, uh, the American Special Forces actually killed uh, Bin Laden in a compound in Pakistan. Okay, after that, Al-Qaeda was greatly weakened. And so, like I said, another group of extremists within Al-Qaeda, they split and they formed uh, the arguably the, the more... Um, dangerous and more widespread organization known as ISIS, okay, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. Okay, and today they continue to commit terrible terrorist uh, acts all across the world. Yeah, so as I said just now, uh, Al Qaeda and ISIS's use of Islam to justify their actions have already led into a lot of uh, inadvertent backlash against the Muslims. Okay, so a lot of these Muslims are peaceful. They've denounced the actions of these, uh, you know, terrorist groups. But yet, people are still, uh, you know, having this Islamophobic uh, ideology. Okay, so in fact, it has also term turned into a form of extremism itself. This uh, Islamophobic ideology has also turned into a lot of radical uh, extremist uh, ideas, especially in other countries. All right, so... 
uh, it, it has now turned into a very terrible, misinformed global phenomenon known as Islamophobia. Okay, so this is something that is quite sad, uh, to be honest. And is there things we can do about it? Definitely. Okay, but uh, I think uh, it, it, it has gotten so bad recently uh, that, you know, a lot more needs to be done. Definitely. Okay. Now, more recently, just last year, uh, the American invasion of Afghanistan came to an end on the 30th of August 2021 after uh, the President of the United States. Okay, so both President Trump and President Biden, they facilitated the pullout of American troops from Afghanistan 20 years after 9-11. Okay, and it, like I say, in a very cruel twist of irony, uh, as these evacuations were happening, an ISIS terrorist suicide bombing killed hundreds of people outside Kabul airport in the Afghanistan capital, where a lot of people are trying to get out of the country from. Okay, so it's it's really sad. Okay, to see such things. Okay, by uh right now I think, um, during the years after the war on terror, or rather, uh during the years after, the end of the Taliban regime, uh in Afghanistan. Uh, a more democratic, so-called democratic government took its place. And then after the US troops pulled out, all right, the Taliban retook control of the country today. And, and they are still going on today as well. Okay, so uh, as you can see, uh, there, there is still a very terrible phenomenon that is still ongoing until today. Okay, so, so um, more definitely needs to be done. And we'll discuss on how we can actually mitigate the effects of terrorism uh, today as well. Okay, in Singapore, we have also faced a very serious terrorist threat from 2001 onwards. Now, there is a local uh, regional terrorist group which is linked to Al-Qaeda, which is known as the Jemaya Islamia, okay, or J.I. Okay, so uh, thankfully, in 2001, our Internal Security Department was able to uh, capture these uh, terrorists before they could carry out any attacks. So, uh, the Singapore branch of the JI actually planned a uh, terrorist attacks uh, on Changi Airport, MOE, MINDEF headquarters, uh, and most notably the Yishun MRT station. Okay, I think if you ask your parents, they will probably tell you something about this uh, Yishun MRT plot. Okay, and, and so... Um, what they actually were planning to do then was to, you know, explode or detonate explosive uh, when a, a, a bunch of these American uh, Navy personnel, I believe, uh, were disembarking at the Eastern MRT station because uh, usually because uh, the Americans use uh, our, our naval bases here. So they will usually have a transport from Eastern MRT station. Okay, so their plan was to just uh, detonate explosives to kill uh, these American servicemen. Okay, so thankfully our ISD found out of their plans and arrested them all before they could even carry out the attacks. Okay, and and this idea has continuously okay been uh, propagated a lot more radicalism in today's age as well. So the ISD is continuously working to prevent any terrorist attacks from happening in the first place. Now. Uh, there is one very important idea here, and it's the idea of self-radicalization. Okay, so today, terrorists themselves don't even need to make their way over to, uh, you know, countries like Singapore. They can actually influence what we call lone wolf terrorists, okay, who are simply taken in by the propaganda that these extremist terrorist groups actually post online. And when you consume too much of these things, um, I think some people do uh, in turn become uh, influenced by this. And uh, actually, uh, a lot of people, uh, a lot of countries have reported a lot of serious incidents involving self-radicalization. Okay, where, uh, you know, individuals who have no previous link to terrorism just go out and commit these terrorist acts okay, in their societies. Okay, for instance, in Orlando, in Florida, in the US, okay, a self-radicalized terrorist killed 49 people and injured 53 people, okay, which was the uh, highest casualty, second highest casualty terrorist attack after 
okay, which is you can see the severity of this situation. Uh, in Singapore as well, okay, we also have uh, such issues. In fact, uh, if you just see this year and last year, you also have seen reports of the ISD detaining uh, certain people, even youths, okay, uh, because they have had plans, okay, or plots to commit terrorist acts in Singapore, all right? So there, it's not about whether you're educated or not educated, even well-educated people can become self-radicalized, and this is what we see in Singapore. Okay, they become extremists. They become people who want to commit horrible things and, and destroy Singapore as, as a whole. And they're influenced by extremist propaganda, which is freely available on the internet. Furthermore, with COVID and everybody having to go online, okay, to continue our lives, this has been made even, even more worse, right? Because everybody is now more connected to the internet. So the more likely they're able to, you know, come into access with this terrorist propaganda and they would maybe some of them would end up being influenced okay to to carry out uh, terrorist acts here in Singapore itself and they, they have no relation to terrorist groups they're just being taken in by they're being brainwashed by by these terrorist propaganda okay and there's a misconception that oh, all terrorists are, are from the Islamic faith no uh, it's not true Terrorism doesn't, you know, speak about religion or, or what makes us different. Anybody can be a terrorist. Okay? In Norway, in 2011, 77 people were killed because of a terrorist attack by a self-radicalized Christian by the name of Anders Bering Breivik, okay, who was angered by his uh, Norway's liberal attitude towards multiculturalism and Muslim immigration. As you can see, Islamophobia itself, which came as a result of the terrorist attacks on September 11th. Uh, in fact, it has been around for even longer than that. But it became much more prevalent after 9-11. Islamophobia became its own radicalized group. Okay, so people you use Islamophobia as the basis to commit even more extreme terrorist attacks all around the world, which is really sad to see. Okay, so as you can see, uh, it's not just uh, Muslims that are, you know, uh, not just Muslims who are committing terrorist attacks. Anybody can be a terrorist. That's why we have to be vigilant and we do not assume, we do not discriminate simply because uh, you know, somebody looks like, you know, a stereotype of being terrorist or being extremist. No. We, anybody can be terrorist. Okay, this is very, very important to know. Next. Managing transnational terrorism. So, now that we know the impact of transnational terrorism, we need to know how we can, you know, prevent, okay, or at least mitigate the effects of transnational terrorism. So, it's very complex to do so. So definitely there's a lot of cost and there's a lot of trade-offs. And uh, some of these trade-offs eventually cause a lot of tensions in society as well. Okay, so it's up to you whether to evaluate whether certain ideas or certain policies uh, have more pros and, pros and cons or, or more cons than pros. Okay, so we do this, okay, we manage it through three different methods. Preventive, protective, responsive. Okay, so these three types of methods. First of all, preventive measures. Now, preventive measures are essentially measure, measures to prevent a terrorist attack from happening in the first place. Okay, so uh, they are a form of deterrence as well, you can call it that. Now, the first idea here is border control. Now, border control, okay, we establish uh, security checkpoints at our borders to stop the movement of terrorists and explosives or other uh, hazardous material from entering Singapore or any other country. Okay, so uh, if you notice on your passport, there's actually a microchip on it. Okay, so this is a biometric passport. Now, this passport, this type of passport allows us to much easily, uh, much easier to, to identify certain terrorists, okay, to come in using forged passports. Okay, so uh, this is one of the measures that we've taken. Uh, in Singapore, ICA has also uh, used a lot of uh, 
new technology such as the video graphic scanner portal okay to scan uh for dangerous items in, in vehicles or shipments uh in uh, at our border checkpoints uh the u.s okay some uh, uh in the u.s they also have something called the no-fly list okay so essentially uh no-fly list will ban anybody who is suspected to be a terrorist from boarding any aircraft to the u.s even if they are american citizens okay so to them okay to the government this will stop and this will help stop suspected terrorists from entering the country okay but some people believe that this is a violation of the right to right of freedom of movement okay which is guaranteed under the universal declaration of human rights but uh same thing this is also a pros cons issue okay so again for you to evaluate which one is greater now the second type of preventing measures is collaboration like i mentioned just now with cyber security transnational terrorism also requires international collaboration to mitigate now because of the globalized nature of terrorism today okay we realize that no individual country can fight modern day terrorism on its own. So we definitely need to work with other countries in the region and around the world as well. The United Nations also passed a resolution okay, for member states to share information about terrorists okay, and individuals and also calling on other governments to work together to combat terrorism. Okay, so the UN also established something known as the Counter-Terrorism Committee, which is essentially this organization uh, where member countries can contribute and to fight, help fight terrorism uh, within their own countries and other people's countries as well. Uh, Interpol, okay, also known as the International Police, okay, these, uh, this organization also works uh, with uh, other police force in other states, okay, to uh, facilitate essentially the collaboration between these countries okay to stop terrorist activities from happening and to share information okay so uh, the idea is that we want to enhance the abilities of members countries to fight terrorism okay so uh, one of the ways that they have uh, tried to do this is by introducing the fusion task force or the ftf okay so we are monitoring terrorist groups at 24 7 all across the world so uh, as you can tell sharing of inf intelligence is imperative okay for uh, countries collaboration to stop terrorism in our modern world today okay singapore also really believes in this idea and so we have also done our part to to cooperate with other countries to stop terrorism for instance we are part of the csi not not crime scene investigation but container security initiative led by the us Okay, it's essentially to, to protect maritime security. So they are scanned uh, to stop any, you know, to detect any bombs, explosives or hazardous material that can be used for terrorist activities. Okay, in ASEAN, we have also uh, formed something called the ASEAN Ter Counterterrorism Workshop. Okay, where our states, member states, can actually uh, exchange information and practices to prevent uh, terrorist attacks from happening in the ASEAN region. Now, uh, this example here, okay, we will show you the importance of collaboration. Now, I think some of you may remember, okay, your parents saying something about Mas Salamat. Mas Salamat is in actually the leader of JI in Singapore. Okay, remember JI are the people that tried to commit a lot of terrorist attacks in 2001. Okay, so he managed to evade arrest in 2001, okay, by fleeing to Indonesia. However, he was caught by Indonesian authorities and deported back to Singapore in 2006. He was held under detention. However, somehow he managed to escape from detention in 2008 and he fled to Malaysia. But the Malaysians also caught him in 2009 and they deported him back to Singapore where he still kept until today. Okay, so the only reason why we were able to recapture Mas Masalama after so long, okay, after so many times, is because of the collaboration between Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia, and also the intelligence that we shared uh, within the ASEAN uh, countries as well. 
Yes, the only reason why he was caught so swiftly, okay, uh, by you know the Malaysians or or the Indonesians as well, and it greatly, uh, you know, stopped the the okay it rather it, it reduced the threat of terrorism, especially by the GI themselves, okay. So as you can tell, the cooperation between uh member states or countries okay is very very important if you want to have a chance okay at preventing terrorism. Okay, so when we arrested the J I members, they actually we actually shared our in our knowledge, okay, our information with other countries, so that they can themselves take on the J I branch in their own countries. Now, terrorism fight, okay, doesn't stop with the government, the public ourselves, okay, we also have a role to play in this idea. There's a reason why we have total defense. In nineteen eighty four. We introduced total defense to involve the entire nation at large in the defense of our countries. Okay, so uh, the few pillars of total defense: military, civil, economic, social, psychological, and digital. Now these pillars will now okay lead us in in our ways okay as we deal with the challenges of the future, especially one of transnational terrorism. So the concept of TD is that. Everybody has a role to play in remaining vigilant, so that we can prevent terrorist attacks from ever happening in Singapore. So that was preventive measures. Now, protective measures. Protective measures are more, you know, more harder measures. Okay, especially instituted to specifically prevent terrorism from happening. Okay, and to detect any suspicious activities. So this is what we call protective measures. The first type of protective measures is surveillance. Now, surveillance uh, has been in enhanced in a lot of places, such as uh, key installations like power stations, MRT stations, airports, seaports, all these things. Okay, these locations are more, uh, you know, preferred by terrorists, so there is more surveillance to protect these areas. So our home team forces and our Singapore armed forces. We have all worked together, okay, to protect our important installation areas. For example, Jurong Island, okay, is a petrochemical hub. It's a very important uh, installation for Singapore. So, our Singapore Armed Forces have also worked with the Singapore Police Force, Singapore Police Coast Guard, to protect this area as well. The Navy works with the Police Coast Guard to protect our waters. And uh, the air force works with CAS to protect our skies. Okay, so as you can see, civilian and military agencies all working together to protect Singapore. So governments around the world have also increased surveillance on their citizens so that we can fight terrorism. However, at the same time, like I said, another pros cons issue. Huh? They some people believe that this is a intrusion of privacy. Okay, which is a very very big problem. Okay, so uh, there needs to be a trade off that needs to be done here. Okay, you can't have both. So either you compromise or you choose one over the other. Okay, in the U.S. there was a full body scanners in two thousand seven that was introduced by the TSA. These can detect very dangerous hidden objects, but Essentially, uh, the machine stripped down these uh, people that were going through the security check. Okay, so this was seen as a very serious violation of personal privacy. Okay, so the way the American government handled it was by uh, replacing these scanners with something else, something that was less intrusive but still serves its purpose. The second type is detention without trial. Now, detention without trial, okay, is essentially we are able to detain okay a whole somebody in custody who is deemed to be a terrorist indefinitely indefinitely means forever and they don't go through the justice system like other criminals no 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 they are held there with no trial okay so uh essentially Detention and arrest uh, is different. Uh. Detention, jail and arrest, these are different things. Detention does not being does not equal being arrest. When I say you're detained, I'm just holding you here. When you're arrested, it means you actually have to go and get charged for a crime. Detention, you don't. I can hold you there 
forever for as long as I want in order to make sure that you are not a threat to Singapore security or whatever country's security. In Singapore, our Internal Security Act allows us to do just that. Anybody who is deemed to be a threat to the well-being of society, the government is allowed to detain them. Okay, this is exactly what happened with the JI and the Bangladeshi terrorists. Okay, so uh, of course, we must always ensure that uh, you know such dangerous people uh, and have uh, essentially an equally uh, severe policy in place. But again, these severe policies, they have a lot of negative repercussions as well. So we definitely need safeguards there to ensure that ISA is not being abused okay, by those in power. So that's why there's an advisory board uh, to review all detentions okay, under the ISA. Okay, the president also has veto powers. Okay, the uh, if the advisory board decides to release them, okay, then the government cannot detain the individual without the president's assent. Essentially, every decision regarding the Internal Security Act will be uh, the final the final decision will be given to the president. Okay, in America, they have a similar policy known as the Patriot Act. Okay, so uh, again, it gives the US government the power to detain indefinitely anybody suspected of being a terrorist. Okay, sometimes they can also be deported from the US with no way to challenge the decision. So you have no, essentially no choice but to, you know, uh, you know, essentially kill over and follow. Okay, again, this act has been critic criticized by a lot of people who believe okay that this is essentially immoral this is not right okay people like this still have human rights that we need to follow okay and especially after the accusations came out that hey, american authorities are actually torturing a lot of these people in detention okay most notably uh, I, I don't know if you uh, you know this but uh, i think for those who study history or uh you know, involved in uh, American entertainment culture, you would have known this place, Guantanamo. Guantanamo. Okay, I don't know if I spelled it right, but essentially it's the Guantanamo Bay, which is uh, actually a place in Cuba where the US has a base there where they hold a lot of these detainees. Okay, and they used to do uh, so called enhanced interrogation, which is a nicer term for torture. Okay, they literally torture them, they waterboat them, they electrocute them, okay, just to get information out of them. And of course, to a lot of people, this is not right, okay, this is abuse of human rights as well. Okay, so there will always be contestation towards uh, such acts that involve detention without trial, okay, and uh, this idea, okay, will continue to cause tension between protecting security and violation of rights. Okay, so it's a trade-off essentially. So which one is more important? Okay, where's the pros? Where's the pros? Where's the cons? Okay, again, for you to evaluate on your own time. Some people argue, okay, that it's too dangerous for these people to ever be free. Very difficult to bring people to court because as we as we mentioned previously, it's very difficult to prove somebody has actually had plans, you know, to, to commit a terrorist attack. Uh, some people also believe that even using torture is fine because we need to uncover information okay, that can save potentially more lives. At the same time, other people feel strongly against the possibility that hey, innocent people, innocent people who are being detained for no reason, are being tortured, are being interrogated, and they have no recourse, okay, no means to prove their innocence or ever be released from detention. Okay, so... It will always be contested. So it's whether whether uh, this government or this country prioritizes rights over safety or safety over rights or they reach a compromise. Okay. So again, this is something that you need to know how to evaluate because uh, it's a very important idea. All right. Last one. Okay. So the last measure, last type of measures that we have is the responsive measures. Okay, responsive measures essentially are measures that are undertaken when the terrorist attack happens. Okay, it can happen at any time. So we must always be ready to respond. Now, 
The first type of responsive measures, okay, is exercises. We perform very frequent contingency exercises to prepare for terrorist attacks. Okay, so essentially these are uh, mock up mock simulations of uh, terrorist attacks and uh, the business owners, individuals, police force, armed forces will all train their response uh, towards such a scenario. Okay, so for example, exercise heartbeat uh, is, a, is an activity where uh, you know, the home team forces or the civil defense forces will come together with the community and they train individuals on uh, responsive measures so what you can do during a terrorist attack. For example, administering aid, uh, getting to safety, hiding, fighting, all these type of things. Exercise North Star okay, is an uh, actual full-scale exercise where a simulated terrorist attack happens and uh, the organizations like the police force and the army will come and respond okay and it also raises the public awareness so uh, I think it has been held at Changi Airport it has been held at MRT stations uh, all around the country okay just as a mock-up and a training opportunity and also awareness opportunity as well second also on the point of international collaboration okay so same thing we work together to prevent terrorist attacks at the same time we also need to work together to respond to terrorist attacks okay so for example our dso national laboratories okay uh, has also been working with other countries on research on these uh, cbre weapons so chemical biological radiological and explosive research and development efforts okay so these are the most common type of uh, weapons that are used by terrorists Okay, so chemical weapons, uh, so it's like using uh, some kind of chemical, deadly chemicals like, uh, what's that called, uh, sarin gas, okay, biological things like anthrax, radiological things, so anything that's uh, made of a hazardous material or radioactive material, explosive, I think it's quite self-explanatory. Okay, so by collaborating with other countries, we are more able to respond to CBRE attacks if and when they happen okay and we share our expertise with other countries for example at the 2013 ASEAN defense ministers meeting okay we shared our and we share and discuss our strategies to counter the rise in this CBRE related terrorist attacks furthermore we also take part in international coalitions to uh, you know essentially to uh, countries that face threats from terrorists okay for example just now I mentioned uh, the war on terror, right? So the war on terror in Afghanistan, which was launched by the US. Okay, uh, our Singapore Armed Forces actually sent personnel to Afghanistan to help out in the International Security Assistance Force. Okay, although we didn't actually engage in fighting per se, we were there to provide mainly humanitarian aid and also our uh, training, okay, purposes to train the local Afghanis okay into protecting their own countries from terrorist threats as well and uh, we also contributed to intelligence gathering okay for those ground forces who will be fighting the war on terror okay war on terror not war of terror that's a completely different meaning i apologize war on terror okay so uh, actually you can find a lot of uh, videos by mindef online which can actually tell you a little bit more about uh, what singaporean uh, armed forces personnel were doing in Afghanistan during that time. Okay, I think it's a very interesting to read up about. And with that, that is the end for this chapter. And with that, we have concluded the entire social studies content syllabus. The remaining video, okay, uh, lecture video at least in uh, for this series will be actually on skills, examination skills, so source-based case study skills and also structured response question skills. Okay, okay. just before we end, uh, I'd like to say that this lesson is actually dedicated to all these innocent civilians and service members who have lost their lives in the fight against global terrorism. It's very deadly, very sad trend, okay, that a lot more terrorist attacks are happening today, especially as our borders reopen. Okay, so uh, we, must, we must remember, okay, the lessons that we, we learn, okay, from these terrorist attacks. And we have to do more 
okay, ourselves as individuals, as a country, as a world, to prevent okay, any more of these terrorist attacks from taking even more innocent lives everywhere in the world. Okay? And with that, we will end today's lecture. All right? So thank you very much uh, for staying all the way. All right? That's all I have for today. If you have any questions, again, feel free to leave it in the comment sections below. Okay, don't forget, uh, please like and subscribe to uh, this channel. Okay, we spend a lot of time and effort making these materials and videos for all of you. Now, I hope you, this has helped you understand a little bit more about Unit 11. Okay, especially after two years of common last topic, this is now back in our syllabus. Okay, so I hope it at least helped you understand a little bit more. Okay, so with that, I will see you for the last video in this uh, lecture series for social studies in the next lecture about skills. Okay, see you then. Bye-bye.